Several years ago, when I was living in Indiana, I had a conversation with someone who was on the phone, and in the course of that, they said, well, I, I'm not familiar with the Church of Christ, and the nature of the conversation, I couldn't really pause there and have a, a whole a whole discussion on that, and so after that, that uh, phone call ended, then later I thought, well, I, I should write him a letter and, and explain some things that we didn't have a chance to talk about. After I did that, I realized... You know, I'm probably not the first one that's been you know, maybe caught off guard or in a situation where he couldn't stop and, and derail the conversation and go in that direction. And so from that letter that I wrote this individual, uh, I developed the lesson that we're going to, to look at this morning. Because we all want to use the opportunities that arrive uh, at, from time to time, and yet again, sometimes those opportunities aren't in the moment. And so to, to help us think about uh, the the, the way that we can answer questions that people have or things that they uh, say that they're thinking about. What do people who ask or think this, well, I'm not familiar with the Church of Christ, what, what do they need to know? That's what we'll consider this morning. Well, before we would talk to someone about uh, the Church, the Church of Christ, we would first want them to know about the Christ of the Church. And so if someone said, well, I'm not familiar with the Church of Christ, again, depending on the situation, the, the conversation, how well they know you, how well you know them, in some way you want to know and, and help them to think about, are they familiar, do they know who Jesus is, and what do they know about salvation? We touched on some of this as we did an overview of the book of Mark in our, our class this morning. That's where we learn about who Jesus is, Mark, we noted, emphasized that Jesus was called the, the Son of Man and then also the Son of God. He's called the Christ, of course. That emphasizes that He fulfilled the prophecies that were, were given in the Old Testament. And then Paul summarizes much about Him in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And read with me verses 3 and 4, where he says, "...for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received." that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Then He goes on to give a, a list of, of eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And in verse 25 He says, He must reign till He has put all enemies under His feet. And so when Jesus said, All authority, Matthew 28, has been given to Me in heaven and on earth, uh, Jesus was not just <clears throat> asserting that. Uh, that. That was the reality based upon all of His life and all of His teachings. And dependent on what someone knows about His life and His teachings and his, the purpose of His death and the reality and the basis of His resurrection and even His authority and His reign today, uh, that's, that's what first has to be understood. Then turn to Romans chapter 5. Jesus is not just a historical figure because of doing great acts of courage and, and because He taught these words of wisdom and, and that have continued to have great influence. Jesus came to save because there was a problem called sin. And Paul summarizes the life and the teachings and the influence and the, the salvation that Jesus came and, and offers in Romans chapter 5, read with me verses 6 through 11. He says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified, by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So there's several words in this paragraph. Saved, and justified, and reconciled, or reconciliation. That's, that's all this message of salvation that Paul summarizes. And for the most part, within the book of Romans, we can learn about how we have access to that salvation. It's offered to all men. Uh, 
And so Jesus said, take the gospel to, to all the world, to every creature. Well, it, he offers it to all, but not everyone has received that. And so how do I receive that? When, when does God give it? Well, in Romans chapter 5, still here, just back in, in verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible here states we are justified, we are saved by faith. It's absolutely true. Just as we were studying about Mark being written to a Roman culture, part of American culture for different reasons is when people read Romans 5 verse 1, often they read we're justified by faith, but in their mind they read that means we're justified by faith alone. And there's a huge difference between being saved by faith and being saved by faith alone. Before Jesus left, and just stay in Romans, but in Luke 24, Jesus sent the apostles out and He sent them out to preach repentance and remission of sins. So there Luke could have recorded that Jesus sent, out, sent them out to teach faith and repentance of sin, and that would certainly have been proper. And faith is essential. And without faith, it's impossible to please Him. But an in, in equal, equally important first principle, fundamental part of the remission of sins is not faith only, but faith in repentance. And so that was a basic part of what was taught. But I uh, mentioned the book of Romans. We'll, we'll fill out this subject for us. In Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we see, uh, we see faith and, and repentance working together. Beginning in verse 9, Paul says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So in this context, on this occasion, Paul doesn't say anything about repentance, but he links faith and confession. And so another reason we're not saved by faith alone is because we have to confess that faith in order to be saved. And until that faith comes out of our heart and out of our mouth, then, according to Paul's words here, we are not yet saved. And then in Romans chapter 6, so just, just a few words. Always remember the, the, the chapter breaks are man's judgment on when there's some transition in thought, but what is said in chapter 6 is influenced by chapter 5 and, and connected to it. In chapter 6 and verse 3 of Romans, he says, Or do you not know? that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death. He goes on to, to say more about that, but just, just summarizing for now, here I just want to call attention to that phrase being baptized into His death. We remembered His death just a moment ago, His body and His blood, and the most important part of His death is that his death brought the remission of sins. And he even said that on the night that he introduced the Lord's Supper. This is my blood that is given for the remission of sins. And so as, as Paul said in chapter 5, that we are, are justified by his blood. Well, when are we justified by his blood? When are we justified by his death? How, we can't get in a time machine and go back to the cross and get some of that blood off of the cross and wipe it on our body as though we would be washed from our sins by His blood in that literal way. So when does His blood wash away and remove our sins? As Paul explains here, and he says, you, you Romans, you already know this, you were baptized into His death. Since His death is what removes our sins, being baptized into His death is when those sins are washed away. And that's exactly how Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. We started in verse 41, but back in verse 38, he urged them to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for that purpose, for the remission of sins. So here are some first principles, and there are some things that even would go back beyond this that would be basic, the, the authority of the Old Testament. But in the context of this lesson, in thinking about the church, well, before really there's, we would say anything about the church, we ourselves and, and then help others to first be familiar with Jesus Christ, the problem of sin, and then the offer of salvation. Once then someone has 
to whatever degree, a grasp of the salvation that God offers, then they're familiar with the idea that there are people that are saved or that God is willing to save all men. And that then introduces them really to this, this word church. Uh, God identified the saved, that group of people, in a number of different ways in the New Testament. Uh, I'm not going to read these verses, but just reference the highlights uh, that Jesus said, I will build my church. What he meant by that, of course, was, was not that I'm going to build this structure on a particular piece of property, but by that he meant I'm going to save those who are lost. That's how he would build his church. And so those saved are referred to in that way, and that just refers to a group of people who have been called out, who have been brought out and brought into, into Christ. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, uh, those same people are referred to as one body. That we are saved in one body. And so you could think of a lot of the lessons that we learn by the word body, of how a body is, is connected and interconnected, interdependent on each other in part, primarily dependent upon the head. All of those lessons are, are filled out and worth, worth thinking about. But God summarized all of that by referring to those people as a body. In verse 13 of the same chapter, He refers to those people as the kingdom. That when we've been delivered from the power of darkness, God has transferred us, moved us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And later in, in Ephesians chapter 2, He calls those people citizens. And so lots of lessons that we learn from that. They're also called the household of God in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. The, the group of the saved or the household or the family of God. So we all have different families, different last names. He's talking about a different family of which Christ is the head. So in this sense, anybody who has read the Bible enough to have heard about salvation, they have heard of, as Jesus said, my church. They've heard of the church that Jesus Christ established. Maybe they hadn't thought of it in that way, but that, that's where we go to learn about that group who is saved. It's also important to recognize that's different than the churches, the same word, but two, two different applications of that. The word church can mean all who are saved, but then also the New Testament uses that word in a way that refers to the saved who live here and there and who commit to working together. That, that's really the, the emphasis of the churches. And so whether it's the churches of Christ, Romans 16, 16, the churches of God, 1 Corinthians 2, sometimes the, the place where they were living or they met was included. And so Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, to the church of God which is at Corinth. Uh, you, you see the emphasis of all of that. It's focused upon who they are and who they belong to to Jesus, to Jesus Christ, to God. So when you read the New Testament, that, that's where you learn about the churches, the churches of Christ, the churches of God. That is simply saved people who commit to work together and then who continue to work together in the work that God has given for them to do. So at this point, we could just say, well, since that time, about 2,000 years ago, what, what has changed from then until the year 2021? Has anything changed about who, who is the head of the church, the body, the kingdom, that family? That, that hasn't changed over time. What, what has changed in, in the nature of salvation? Or what has changed about the group of those who are saved? Or what has changed in regards to those who are saved but who live in, in different places? And so those who live in the, the same place, committing to work together, well, nothing about that really has changed. People may live in different geographic areas, but the very core, the basics of that, nothing has changed since then. So if someone says, well, I, I'm not familiar with the Church of Christ, again, depending on the person and, and what you know about them and they know about you, you could just simply remind them, well, if you've read about the church in the New Testament, then that's where you've been introduced to the church, that one group. And then that's where you can also, as we read in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 47, read about Christians who commit to working together. 
and that they are referred to in the New Testament as the churches of Christ. So scripture is the place where first we want to introduce men to, to, to Jesus and to his salvation and to his church and then to his churches and, and ideally in that order, right? But then we wouldn't stop there. Then we ourselves continue to learn and we urge others to continue to learn, to, to keep on reading about uh, the Christ and about those who followed him and what, what happened then? Okay, so Christians work together. Well, then what? Well, read about how they were taught to worship when they assembled together. And the song that we sang the, the first day of the week uh, did, did some good teaching on that topic, so I, I won't go into detail now. What we read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 is a, a good summary of what Christians did when they came together for the purpose of worshiping God. We have to, to keep learning, keep reading, and find out, well, what were they taught to do when they were working together? What did the church in the New Testament do, and what did they not do? Because there, there are actually some things that are, are generally good to do that the church is even told not to do, either explicitly or, or implicitly. Uh, we, we mentioned in Bible class the, the changing of our culture's view about the death penalty, well, is it, is it good for someone who has committed some particular crimes for them to be put to death? Romans 13 would say, yeah, that, that was God's plan for, some, for His vengeance to be given through the hands of those who are in authority. That is a good thing to do. Is that a good thing for the church to do? Should we say, well, since that's a good work, since that is God's plan, we, we should be, be executing criminals? Well, no. No, I think everybody would, would, would see through that. Everything that we might label a good work is not necessarily something that is good for the churches to be doing. So the point is we've got to open the Scripture and see what was their focus, what was their mission, what, where did they keep their eyes and their hands and, and, and focus on that, even how were they organized in their work together. And at first that might, even, that might also seem trivial. Well, what difference does it make how they're organized? If if they're Christians and they're working together, then I mean, who cares who the who who cares who the leaders are? And yet, if we think about organization in the family, uh, my guess is everybody here would agree the organization of the family is pretty important. That it be male and female, and then God has given different roles and responsibilities within that organization called the family. Yeah, organization matters when God, in His wisdom, reveals a plan for organization. And so we would just urge each other and others to keep learning and see how they worked together. Keep reading and find out what, what they did with the money that they collected. What we did this morning is not our tradition. Uh, the third verse of the song we sang mentioned that as well, 1 Corinthians 16, that on the first day of the week they, they gave as they had prepared. And then turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. One other point that we, we need to remember and help others to remember is that the churches were also warned of changes that would happen in the future and were also warned of what would happen if as a church, one of these churches, if they persisted in error. The fact that that was going to happen is, is told here by Paul to Timothy. 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 3. Paul tells him, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. So notice that they leave it. That means they were once participating in the faith. But then they depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So sometimes error that is considered serious by God, by man, might seem to be somewhat trivial. What Paul warns Timothy about here is watch out for people who are going to bring damnable doctrines, doctrines of demons, when you hear that phrase, at least I do, that makes me think, boy, you've got something really, a tidal wave of error about to come. And then the examples that Paul gives seem to be relatively minor. There could be worse things, right? 
than someone saying, well, no, you, you can't marry, or no, don't, don't eat certain kinds of foods. I mean, nobody likes to be told what to do by someone who doesn't have the authority. But, you know, on the scale of things, there, couldn't there be worse things than someone forbidding that? Well, maybe. But you see the danger here that Paul warns of is someone who says, well, I'm going to make up my own rules, and not only for how I live my life, but you have to follow my rules. That, that's as serious a problem as, as there can be. And so Paul warns Timothy that that's going to happen. And then what's the consequences? What, what happens if a Christian, or what happens if a, a group of Christians working together? What happens if a church uh, uh, persists in some error? I won't read it now, but I'll just leave it to you to review Revelation chapters 2 and 3, that when a church persists in error, then Jesus says at some point, I'll, I'll cut you off and I, I, won't, I won't view you, I won't accept you as mine anymore. You, you may still claim me. You may still claim to be a church belonging to me, but I won't claim you as being a church that belongs to me. And that, those warnings are scattered throughout the New Testament. So, if people are not familiar with the Church of Christ, then we just want them to learn and keep learning because hopefully that's what e each one of us are doing. But then it's also worth hitting the pause button for a minute and helping people to realize when you read the New Testament, and let's just stay in the first century for a moment before we get to the, the 21st century. When you read the New Testament, what other church are you familiar with than this one that we've looked at here? When you read the New Testament, how many different kinds of churches, how many different kinds of religious groups are you introduced to just when you read the New Testament? That, that's a relatively simple answer. Now, of course, we have to go through about 2,000 years. And so then we have to say, well, today... We have to compare what we read there with what we see today in ourselves and in each other. So what we also need to be willing to do, the right time and the right way, is invite someone who asks this question to say, well, come and, and, for example, visit us. We meet on Chena Small Tracks Road. And compare what you read that the Holy Spirit has revealed in Scripture about the churches. Compare what you read to us. Are we saying and practicing the things you can read there? And then challenge them to do that with every other religious group. Just because the word church or even church of Christ is on a sign doesn't guarantee faithfulness to Christ. Revelation chapters 2 and 3 would, would, would imply that. And so every religious group needs to be compared with the teachings and the practices of the churches of Christ in the New Testament. Well, then that introduces a question that I'd be surprised if every single person here has either not thought about and wondered about themselves, much less have been asked the question. Well, then why is it that there are so many different kinds of churches today? This is one reason many people are not familiar with the Church of Christ, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, because in the past when there was something called the Yellow Pages, and you might go back to the religious section of that paper phone book. Well, of course, you go through and you see all kinds of different religious groups. Today, you just do the same on, on the Internet. But the point is, there's so many different kinds of religious groups today that, that that's just what people are, are, are most familiar with for different reasons. And I, I've been asked this question before, and it's, it's a question on the, the banner that we hang up sometimes when we go out into the community to teach. It's one of the questions that, that sometimes we pose there. Why are there so many different kinds of churches? Because it's clear when we open the Bible, it isn't that way. There are not many different kinds of churches teaching many different kinds of doctrines that can contradict each other, and yet Jesus just says, well, I, I just accept all of them. So how did we get from the way things were to the way things are? And does it even matter? Uh, I just want to look at, at two reasons. This could be a whole study in and of itself, but try in a summary fashion, give two reasons why there are so many different kinds of churches today. One of the simplest answers is because there are teachings 
that originate with man and that did not originate with God. We read just a moment ago from 1 Timothy 4 where Paul gave that explicit warning that he says, the Holy Spirit plainly says in the latter times there will be other teachings. And that's just one. Um, let, let's read Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. This is not, uh, this is not a, a, just an occasional theme. This is, this is pretty regular throughout the New Testament. Warnings, that, that, uh, warnings about other teachings. And so as Paul writes to the churches in the, the region of Galatia, beginning in verse 6, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from Him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. So just think about that. Could it be that one reason there's many different kinds of churches could the problem be today what Paul was saying was already happening then, that there were many different kinds of Gospels? And he goes on to say, now when I say that, there's only one original Gospel, but when someone alters the message of the Gospel, that actually makes it a completely different message. It may not be 100% different, but the substance of it is changed. So now if you have two Gospels, and you have two different messages being spread, well, then we could see that that would lead to two different kinds of, uh, of religious groups or two different kinds of churches. In, in Acts chapter 20, Paul warned about this uh, again. Paul, of course, wrote 1 Timothy. He wrote what we were just reading in Galatians. And then when he was meeting with the, the elders, the pastors from the church in Ephesus, he reminds them of what he had been teaching for over three years and we'll just read verses 29 and 30. He says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse or misleading things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. I, I don't know that we have a specific record of when that happened, but just because of the certainty of it happening, then think about what would happen. If you had the, the church that belonged to the Lord in Ephesus, and then from the leadership, some began to teach misleading things, and some disciples followed them, but some didn't, well then what are you going to have? Now you're going to have two different religious groups in that town, still teaching some things that were the same, but teaching some things that are different, teaching things different from not only each other, but more importantly, somebody's teaching something that's different than the, the message that Paul had taught. So now in Ephesus, you, have, you would have the same kind of thing that we have today, probably just at that point on, on a smaller scale. Think of it this way. If, if you want to work at Walmart, well, Walmart policy and procedure and, and an application, if you follow that, that's going to make you part of the Walmart family. But if you follow the Walmart policy and procedure and application, that doesn't make you a member of Fred Meyer, does it? Totally different. Similar in some ways, sure, and I'm sure in, in their, the details there's going to be some similarity, but two different groups. And so being a part of one doesn't automatically make you a part of the other. The, the gospel of Christ makes a sinner... A Christian and someone who is a Christian as we've noticed already that makes them a part of this group that that Christ is in charge of but what if I don't realize it but I follow I'm followed I'm following some teachings that originated with man and not with God it's almost like oh, I thought I was applying to Walmart but then I look at the letterhead oh that was Fred Meyer application I, I just got the wrong application Following human teachings makes me, whether I realize it or not, a follower of man. 
as I go then uh, through human history where we have these, these warnings in Scripture, and, and now we, we have to go outside of Scripture to look at the, the people and places and teachings and events that happened after the gospel, after Scripture was fully revealed. And so this takes a little extra work, uh, but uh, a, even a summary of, of history reveals that over the course of centuries, there were different teachings, there were controversies, there were traditions that did not, that did not begin with Jesus, that did not begin with the apostles, and they were introduced. They were sometimes controversial for a time, but then after a while they became accepted, and they became, became to be viewed as equally acceptable and true as the things that, that are in Scripture. So here's some examples of, of some of those things. I'm not going to try to go into a detailed study of these. But after the time of the New Testament, there began to be false teachings about just what sin is. And so the, the teaching arose that we were guilty of sin just because we're human. We inherit the sin of Adam. But the Bible does not teach that. All have sinned. Those who are guilty of sin, it's because they've chosen that. We, we've all chosen to sin, but we're not sinners because of Adam. But that, that controversy arose over time. And then the idea that, therefore, we are, are born with a sinful nature. So that was introduced. Then over time, because of that, now you had false teachings about who needs to be saved. In the New Testament, you, you never see that, that any baby needs to be saved. But then over time, because of error about what sin is and who's, who has the stain of sin, now you've got to have a new teaching that is not in the Bible about who needs to be saved. And so the introduction of the practice of saving babies, so-called. So over time, false teachings arose about when God saves. And so, well... God saves someone when they're baptized, uh, and so we, uh, so a baby comes out of, uh, a baby is born, and so if they're baptized, then they're saved. That's when God saved them. Well, but, but what are they being saved from? They don't have any sin. Well, they, they inherited it. And so you see that the pile and the tradition and the controversy gets bigger and bigger. And then, well, sprinkling and, and pouring water, that, that's baptism. Or, uh, and that's when, that's when God saves, when, when water is poured or, poured or sprinkled. Or the idea that, that we're saved at the, the moment that we believe, or say a sinner's prayer. Uh, these, these teachings accumulated over time, and some agreed and some didn't agree. And some accepted teachings that were not true because it's the tradition. Some accepted a teaching that wasn't true because of a misunderstanding of what the Bible says. And there's time to learn and to grow in all these things, but you, you start to see the development that over the course of time, numerically, the number of occasions and topics grew and grew and grew, and to our day, that, that process sadly continues. All sorts of teachings today, uh, permitting divorce for any reason, uh, the idea that if a Christian sins, it, it's okay, he's still right with God. Uh, then changes to the, the work, as I alluded to a little bit ago, about the local church, that, well, we can have leaders among a congregation, but then we could have leaders in a completely different place, and they're, they're regional leaders or national leaders, and then even a worldwide leader. Where, where did all that come from? Well, it either came from God or from man, and over time, the number of those things increased and grew. So when, to whatever degree you, you want to go into that, that detail of a study, when you learn the time when teachings that are not in Scripture were introduced and then the process by which they came to be uh, accepted, when you learn that process, then you come to learn pretty easily why there are so many different kinds of religious groups today. And that then has a number of consequences. Uh, this is why people began to call themselves Catholics or Lutherans or whatever, just fill in the blank. Again, we don't read those in the Bible. Nobody ever said, well, I'm a, I'm a Hindu, and that, that it, that's to indicate I follow Christ. We all recognize, well, no, that I means something completely different. Uh, 
No one's ever said, well, I'm a Muslim, and that's a way to communicate to you, I follow Christ. Well, no, that communicates something different. Well, likewise, because of the history with the, the Catholic Church and then the Protestant Reformation, again, some of those things are matters of, not specifically of Scripture, but of history. So then you have Methodist and Episcopalian and, and Mormons. Where, where did all that originate? And why is it there? And those are questions to be sought out and to be searched out. But at the core, it, it really comes back to, at some point, there was a teaching that originated with man and not with God. And so people went different directions. That's one reason why there's so many different kinds of churches today. The second reason is that men are commonly content with that. That, well, we don't believe the same thing. We believe very contradictory things. And that's okay. It hasn't always been that way. Again, if you want to do some research and study, you can find that there, there was a time where a different religious group, a, a Baptist preacher, would debate a Catholic priest and debate him and say, well, no, baptism is immersion. And the Catholic priest would say, well, no, baptism can be immersion or sprinkling or pouring. And they believe contradictory things to the point, not for the sake of having an argument, but of trying to persuade and understand there would be a, a public occasion. Dozens, sometimes even hundreds of people would spend time attending that to hear two different sides present their strongest cases and even to try to answer each other because people said, well, we need to understand what the truth is. And that still happens sometimes today, but it's far more rare in American history than it was in the past. Today, most of the time, people just say, well, we believe different things, but, but it's okay. Let me give an example of that. Uh, uh, th this was an article, and the author was quoting uh, a, a, a religious leader. And so this leader was talking about divorce, eternal salvation, security. Sometimes we call that, that's called once saved, always saved. Uh, second baptism of the Holy Spirit and worship. So my point is, these are the kinds of things that are the context of the statement I want you to read with me. So this, this pastor says, these debates may be important in my congregation, but they are not important to work together and preach the gospel to the city. We accept the differences as a richness. It'd be very boring if all the churches were the same. Imagine if God made just one flower. That would be boring. Would it be boring if God made one flower? God could do it however he wanted. I imagine if God made one, it would probably be the most beautiful flower there is, and it wouldn't be boring, but that's not really the most important part here. But let me just give you about two seconds of silence. You think about that. You see, his point is, we don't believe the same thing. That, that's okay. It doesn't really matter. And he's not talking about what, what time we're going to meet or y'all are going to meet. I'm not talking about those kind of differences, but differences that, that define different kinds of religious groups. Compare, for example, Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 7. Ephesians 4, 4 through 7. Paul says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Is, is that boring because Paul says there's just one? Well, no, that, that's actually the way it should be. And then you wouldn't have different kinds of religious groups. If, they're, if everyone taught the same one, would you? And then think about in Israel's history. Was it boring that God taught them and expected them to teach and to practice the same uniform message, that old covenant? It, they were to worship on the same day, and they were going to the same temple in, in the same city. That, that wasn't boring. That was God's wisdom 
And it was actually for their good, for their benefit. All of it was. And then turn to 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17 and compare this to today and compare what Paul says uh, to, to this statement. Paul tells the saints in, in Corinth, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere and in every church. Paul taught the same message everywhere and in every church. And there, there are Christians even straying from this idea that, well, this passage, Romans 14 or others, permit Christians to disagree about matters of moral and doctrinal importance. This, this thinking has even crept in among Christians. So even if every, everything I've said this morning is wrong, except for what, what we've read from the Scripture, you, you see many of the same conclusions are going to stand. What Paul did is taught the same message everywhere in every church. Why, why don't we expect that today in, in religious groups in, in America? I might be wrong about everything, but what we read from Paul, that's, that's where our confidence is. So this should be the goal of every Christian and every church that is Christ today to seek, the, to, to, seek to teach the same things. The same message everywhere and in every church. And if there's a difference, then there shouldn't be any pride or arrogance. Let's open the Bible and see what was the original teaching. That's what Paul did. And Paul said to the Corinthians, I'm sending, sending Timothy to you because he's going to teach you the same thing. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul's talking to the same one that he sent to Corinth. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, he says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So just think about that. What Paul taught, Timothy was to teach. Timothy was to teach others who would teach the same thing so that they could teach others who would teach the same thing. And how long would that continue? That could even continue for 2,000 years and bring us down to today. And Scripture thoroughly equips us for every good work. If we'll teach only, if we'll guard our ideas and teachings and limit them only to what is in Scripture, then we'll all teach the same things. Would there be occasions where maybe we misunderstand or where we disagree? There will be. But will Scripture help to, to reconcile that and bring us back to the same ideas? It, it might take some time, and, and sometimes iron uh, sharpens iron. There's, there's a process to that, and everybody needs to be patient with everybody in that process. But one reason there are so many different religious groups today is because not everybody, but many people, and in my opinion, I fear more and more people, are just content. If there's different, ter different teachings, different religious groups. That's okay. Jesus is okay with it, so I'm okay with it. But what in Scripture shows that Jesus is okay with that? But this is the second reason why well, that's so common today. But I can't change them. I can just examine my own goals. And you examine your own goal. What's your goal for the gospel and for yourself and for others? Without arrogance and without shame, we all must speak the truth in love with all long suffering. And when we'll open up the pages of Scripture, what we can show people is, not ourselves, we're not trying to convert anybody to us, but we can open up the Scripture and show them there, the church of Jesus Christ. As we do that, let's all remember, we're all in the same process. Learning is a process for everyone. And so we live in a society where people need to learn and be confident that there is a God, that there is a Creator. And then once they learn that, then they can learn that the Bible is His Word. And then they can learn that Jesus has come. And then they can learn that Jesus came to save. And then they can understand some of the things that we have, have looked at today. If we can help you in any step of that process, then 
You're welcome to ask any question of anyone. None of us is above that. We have the Bible to provide an infallible guide in that study. So I hope our, our short study will help you to understand who the church of Christ is, who it belongs to, and then you've got to make the application, then who do you belong to? What is God's plan for you? God's plan for you is the same as it is for me, as it is for all men. That because of our sin, we need to, to turn to Jesus Christ and He'll do the things that we cannot do for ourselves. He'll wash away our sins when we confess Him and repent of our sins because we believe in Him and we trust Him. And then when we're baptized, He'll wash away our sin and our guilt. And then His plan for you is to turn away from any sin you return to and He'll forgive you again. And then He'll guide you and He'll strengthen you and He'll help you in walking in and abiding in Christ for the rest of your life. You won't be perfect, but He'll show you how to strive unto it and forgive you of every sin uh, that... Uh, he'll, he'll forgive you of every sin you confess to Him. I'm going to sing number 269 to give you some time to think about what, what we have studied, cement it in your mind. And then if you come and this morning you're already convinced that you're outside of Christ or you need to return to Him, if we can help you in serving God, that, that's the point, that's the purpose. Tell us how we can, if we can help, as we stand and sing.